Oh, hi. Thanks for coming back. I just wanted to continue teaching you some stories about women of the Bible. I just finished teaching you about Miriam. And you know, sometimes life goes in a different direction than what we had it planned. And certainly her life went on a different direction than what she had planned. I don't know what her plans were, but it went on a different path. So I'm going to give you my little commercial right now because I always forget it at the end. But this book I've written is called Who Will Kill the Spiders? It's about what happens when life takes you down a different path. This is a story of when my husband became ill and how we had to quit running to catch airplanes and just, just live where we were. And I think it's a book that will bring you encouragement. So I would, I would appreciate it if you could buy the book. You can get it from me or you can get it from Amazon. Either way, enjoy. So, I wanted to talk to you today about Deborah. Now, we all know Deborah. There are so many Deborahs in this world, and it's Deborah, Deborah, uh, D E B R A, D E B O R H, or A H, and then in Hebrew, it's Devorah, D E V O R A H, Devorah. And I think that's really a pretty way to say it and to spell it. But Deborah, as we know her, was one of the judges. She was a prophetess, and she was a judge of Israel during the time when Israel was running amok. Joshua has gone in and cleared the land, and the people were living in Israel, and there was no king, there was no leadership, there was no authority. And so it was a time of judges. In fact, the beginning of the book of Judges talks about when, I'll just go back and read that to you real quickly. It says it, it was a time when everybody did what they wanted to do, and it was basically, uh, if it feels good, do it kind of thing. And um, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a good time in Israel. It was it was pretty wild, considering what was to come in the future. And so Deborah was a judge. And if we begin looking at her in uh, the book of Judges, chapter four, we begin to see. Uh, a lot about her. It says, Then the sins, sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ahud died. And the Lord sold them to the hand of Yabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, and the commander of his army, which was Sisera, who lived in Haraseth Hagoim. Okay. This was a time when, okay, whatever feels good, just do it. And Ahud was a judge that had been good. He was a good leader. And everything about this is cyclical. You know, for 40 years, would have a good judge, Israel would get their act together, and they would they would get back into Torah, and they would go like they were supposed to go. And then that judge would die, and then they'd have a time of, of rebellion, if you will. And then, the, then another judge would come up. I don't know how these judges arose, whether they were drafted, appointed, anointed, or what, but they had to be anointed to be a judge of Israel, that's for sure, because they were dealing with a really strong situation. And we've talked many times about people, men especially, sitting in the gates of city of the cities, and they would people would come to them and bring them their their tale of woe, whatever was going on in their life, and the trouble that they were having, and the, the help that they needed. And the judge would sift it all out and say, "This is what I recommend that you do." And so the people would go. Some would follow through. Some would not. And so we would see this kind of a thing happening all over. And so Deborah, being female, was unusual in that she was a judge. And in her unusualness, there was a great amount of wisdom. But she was also a prophet, and her role of being a judge was secondary to her role of being a prophetess. There's good value in being a prophetess at this time because, because of the Lord, she could see ahead. She could see what was coming down the pike to some degree. I mean, she wasn't like she had on... Fox News and she could see the whole story out there before as it unfolded almost in front of her. But she had some concept spiritually of what was happening. And so she was, um, she, she, um, okay, I want to talk about Yabin, king of Canaan, uh, and Sesera, who lived in Hush, ha, Haraseth Hagoim. Now, Haraseth Hagoim is a name that can be translated as a fortress of the nations or, or, craft, or craftsmen of the nations. Either way, the, the name suggests that many nations collaborated in building a city that would be impregnable in any way to a Jewish attack. Really. 
I wonder what. Well, I won't go there. Okay, so anyhow, with this, the whole thing was, it was a fearful time in Israel. You have Sisera and you have Yabin, and you have all these people running amok in the land, and you have marauders and robbers and everything. It's just chaos. But she sat as the judge, and so she wanted to bring a stop to this. Verse 3 says, And the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots, and he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. 20 years they've been putting up with, with him, him being Sisera. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lepidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Okay, Deborah's name means the bee. Bzz, 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 bee. Okay, she's buzzing around. All right, bees are everywhere. You know, they go over here. They do their thing. They get the nectar. They do whatever it is that they're doing over here. And then they get ready to go to the next spot. And then bzz, 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 you know, and who doesn't really run when you hear a bee go bzz, 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 bzz. You know, we don't like that, do we? None of us do. And so she was, she sat there and she judged the people. The people would come to her, as I said previously, and ask for help, ask for wisdom and their decisions, guidance in their decisions. Now we can say, well, why would they do that? Well, how many of us go to our pastor and ask for wisdom, ask for guidance, ask for prayer? Priest, you go to your priest, you ask for wisdom, guidance, prayer. Uh, you go to your psychiatrist and say, oi, why did I do that? You know, and so you, you really, we do look to other people for wisdom. And so she was a woman of great wisdom. And this was, is was a time of great trouble. And she, uh, she used to sit under the trees and the people came and talked to her. And then she summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, the village of Naphtali, and said to him, Behold, the Lord your God of Israel has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you ten thousand men from the sons of Naphtali, and from the sons of Zebulun, and I will draw out to you Sesera, the commander of Yabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. Okay, she's appointing a general. She's telling him what to do, and how to do it, and where to do it. How would she know this? She's female. She's not been in the IDF. She's not been in the Army. I have a granddaughter right now that's a lieutenant in the Army. Very proud of her. But she's had training. She knows how to do specific things. She knows how to lead. But she's been trained. Deborah didn't have that training. Deborah had the Lord. She had his wisdom and his guidance. And so when she sent for Barak, his name means lightning. So when she sent for him, she thought he, she could get him to go just like this. Just like this. Now, Israel has had a, another general named Barak, and he actually became a prime minister of Israel and um, tried to give away most of Israel. Kind of sad story there, but that's I digress. So anyhow, when she sent, to, sent for him and said, this is what I want you to do, he's afraid. He's actually afraid. And he says, uh, in verse 8, he says, Then Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Really? You want your mommy to go with you to war? That's what it looks like, doesn't it? I want you to go with me, Deborah, because I know if you're with me, God will protect me. Okay, so she consults God and she says, All right, as you say, I will go with you, but the victory will not be yours. There will be victory. It will be Israel's victory over Sisera, but the victory will fall into the hands of a woman and it won't be yours. In other words, you're not going to get any glory for this. I'm okay. So you get on your horse, you ride into battle, you do all this stuff, but you're, the glory won't be yours. Now he agrees to this. So this battle, I think it's really interesting. If you've been to Israel, you know that Mount Tabor is almost isolated. You just see this almost a bubble out in the plains of northern Israel. I mean, it's just, it stands alone. And so why would she send him there? Why would she send him to that mountain? Could it be because, be because this is a prophetess? She knows what's going to happen. Now, 
We're talking about 10,000 Israeli soldiers here versus 100,000 or more of Sesra soldiers. Plus, Sesra had 900 iron chariots. Now that's talking about scary stuff. So you have 10,000 Israeli soldiers on foot with probably not real strong weapons. And you had Sesra with his hordes with 900 chariots. And these chariots, of course, they're horse-drawn. And so they're fast and they're mean. And, and you know, if you've seen in the movies, I mean, we know the movies always get it right, don't we? Yeah, we know that. Well, so we see that on the wheels of their chariots, they attached uh, very frightening swords and saws and kinds of things. So they're afraid. Israel's afraid. I would be afraid. Don't tell me you wouldn't be afraid. We'd all be afraid. But he's told to go to, Ses to go to Mount Tabor, and so she's going with him. And they go to Mount Tabor, and they're fighting in the plains of Mount Tabor. And all of a sudden, God shows up. Don't you just love it when he shows up? So he shows up in the form of rain and thunder and lightning and hail. Big time. Rain, hail, thunder, and lightning. Like, whoosh. We had that kind of... Uh, rainstorm last week in Oklahoma. You know what? Animals get spooked when it's storming like that. They don't like it. They're afraid. Now I have this little cute little dog and every time it rains I have to hold him and cuddle him and take care of him because he's just shivering. Well imagine a big horse out in a storm. A terrifying storm where there's rain and lightning and thunder and hail. And it comes in such a torrential force. And the Kishon River runs right at the bottom of Mount Tabor. And it overflows. It's coming so fast and so hard that the water just overflows. And there's mud and gunk. And the horses can't run. And the chariots are made worthless. They get caught in the mud. Have you ever been stuck in the mud? Oh my gosh. I lived on a farm. Four miles of count country road that we had to drive to get to the highway. Four miles of gunk. Now I got to be pretty good at driving that <laughs> down the road. So anyhow, here we have these, these chariots. They don't have steering wheels. They don't have control. They don't have different gears that you can shift into. They're just stuck. And so the best thing that they can do is get out of the chariots, let the horses loose, run for their lives, and try to fight where they are, except they don't fight because now they're fleeing. They're panicked because they know Israel's God has shown up and Israel's God is fighting this war. Wow. So Sisera runs. Big, important general Sisera runs for his life. He hides, he runs, he goes away, and he runs towards the uh, he runs towards the east, and he runs to the tent of Heber the Kenite. Now Heber the Kenite had in a form of allegiance or alliance with with Sisera, whether it was willful or forced, we don't know. But he had a form of an alliance with him. So he thinks he's going to be safe there in Heber's tent. So he runs there. And Yael, Heber's wife, says, sure, come on in. And we don't know about, a lot about Yael. But she was a strong woman. And so he came in. And he was so tired. And he said, can you give me something to drink? And she gave him warm milk that curdled and softened him and made he was so tired and this warm milk made him just go to sleep and he laid down on the couch which was basically the couches then were not like our couches today where they're plush and up and everything like that i mean you can stick a safe straight pin in the couch today but these couches are more not anything more than basically a blanket on the floor or two or three blankets on the floor he laid down there and went to sleep sound asleep and in she comes. Now, remember, she's a woman. And she has been the one, probably has put up the tents, put down the tents. She's strong. And she comes in with a tent peg, probably this long. I don't know whether it was metal or wood. And you don't know that either. But she has this tent peg. And she comes in and she puts it right here. 
right here and wham! And knocks it through his temple, clear through his head into the ground and kills him. And what was it Deborah said to, to Barak? Yeah, I'll go with you, but you won't get the victory in this. A woman will get the victory. Technically, she, uh, when Yael did this, she broke all peace treaties and all everything. Oh, today CNN would be going nuts. But the point is, she, she rose up to the call of God, and she did what God had asked her to do. We don't see anywhere that God said to Yael, kill him or anything like that. But we have to know in our heart of hearts that she was under the unction of the Holy Spirit when she did this. I don't know of too many women that would walk up and do that. First of all, they'd be terrified. Secondly, they would question their own strength. And would they do it? I don't know. Would you do it? I don't know. You know, we say, well, we would, we would fight as women. We would do whatever it took to, to protect our children, to protect our grandchildren, our homes. But would we do that when this is an enemy, not necessarily of your family, but an enemy of Israel? So she did this. And so then we see uh, in, in chapter 5 the entire song of Deborah and Barak. And, the, and it goes on and on and on. And then we go over. I wanted to go to the end of this song because it's really interesting. Let's go to uh, Judges 5. Yeah, 5. Verse 24. Most blessed of women is Yael, the wife of Eber the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. In a magnificent bowl, she brought him curds. This is his last meal. She wants it to be lovely. Very nice. Laid out beautifully. And she reached out her hand for the tent peg, and her right hand for the workman's hammer. Then she struck Sisera. She smashed his head, and she shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he bowed, he, he fell, he lay. Between her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell dead. Pretty clear, isn't it? And then we go on to verse 28. It says, Out of the window she looked and lamented the mother of Sisera through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? Her wise princess said to her, um, indeed, she repeats her words to herself. Are they not finding? Are they not dividing the spoil? A maiden, two maidens for every warrior to Sisera, a spoil of dyed work, a spoil of dyed work embroidery, dyed work of double embroidery on the neck of the spoiler. Thus let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, all thine enemies. Well, if we read this, like I just read it to you, we kind of get the, the feeling that Deborah's going, na 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 and to some degree she is. Because you see, when your enemy, the one who wants to not only annihilate you, but your entire family, when your enemy goes down, there is reason to rejoice. Now we're taught, as Christians, we should just be nice and be sorry about all this stuff. Yeah, okay, it's true. But in war, there's nothing pleasant about it, nothing. And I say this all the time, war is hell. Excuse the French, war is hell. There's no two ways about it. And so when we send our boys and girls into war, we need to give them the ability to do whatever they need to do to defend themselves and to defend their nation without them worrying about going off to prison. Leavenworth, that's not nice. And so what she did here, she had had the vision, the prophetic vision that Barak the war, Israel would win the war. Barak would not get the victory. Yael got the victory. And when this happened, then there was reason to spread it all around. And so when, when you have something in a song, it's much easier for people to remember the song than it is to remember verbiage. And so when you sing it in a song, this is how it's a good way to teach children. Now we can say, well, poor Sisera's mother. Really? 
poor Sisera's mother is sitting at home waiting for the spoils of war. What will he bring me? What will he bring me? Will he bring me embroidery stuff? Will he bring me gold? Will he bring me silver? Will he bring me? Oh my, what will he bring me? Whatever he brings you will be because other people died. That's the spoils of war. And so she was waiting eagerly for him to return. Never crossed her mind that he would not return. This is Cesera, the mighty Cesera, the one who had lived in an impenetrable village, the one who had 900 chariots and a horde of warriors. Why would we think that he wouldn't return? And this is her mother. She, he, she rose, raised him to be a really strong man and to take care of mommy and to do what is right in her eyes. But what is right in her eyes are not, is not necessarily right in God's eyes. For you see, God is the one who gave the victory here. God is the one who put Yael in that place at that time. You know, so much stuff in our lives is like this, instantaneous. Being from Oklahoma City, you know, we had the bombing in, in 1995 when, when the Murrah building was brought down and 168 people lost their lives. And it was a hideous tragedy. And the stories afterwards that came out from that was this instantaneous thing. Like, I couldn't find my car keys. I had a flat tire. I was on my way to work and I had a flat tire. Uh, the kids, I couldn't get the kids around. They were just dragging their feet. And I had, to, I had to take my mother to the doctor. All these stories that came out of survival of people who would have been there that day, who would have been working in that building, who would have died, and God saved their lives. Just like that. Now we can say, well, why didn't he save the other 168 people? He's God. And he knows what our time frame is. Before we're ever created in our mother's womb, we have a moment that is ours to go back to him. So those people then that lived have to know that they went on with life because God had something for them to do. You can say, oh, well, sure, right, we can all say that. Yeah, we can all say that. The question is, do we all do that? Do we all go forward with what God has for us to do in our lives? Are we willing to pick up that tent peg and put it in our hand and hit it with a hammer? Are we willing to do that? Now she has to have known that all that stuff would come back on her face. I mean, do y'all watch forensic files? I watch forensic files. I know a lot about crime scenes. And this is a crime scene. All this stuff sprays and there's blood spatter everywhere and, and brain matter and bone matter. But the point that does matter is that she was doing God's will for, Se for Cesera. He was not a nice guy. He, he was going, he had to be eliminated. And the fact that he was eliminated at the hands of a woman even brought degradation to him. I mean, this mighty warrior, he would far rather have been killed by a soldier than asleep on a couch in a friend's house and the wife kills him? There's no love triangle here. There's nothing extenuating about it. We have a man who was against God and a woman who was for God. That is the extenuating circumstance here. The fact then that Deborah sings about it, Deborah and Barak both sing about it. And, and they sing songs that about his mother, about Cesar's mother. It doesn't mean that they want anything bad to happen to her. It means that they were cognizant of her, knowing that she would be grief-stricken, as any mother would be, but also knowing that she could have, maybe, at least tried to stop her son. You know, even after our, our children are gone from our homes and they're married and they have families of their own, I find that they still want the parental influence in their lives. Now, my boys don't call me every day. We don't talk that frequently. But I always know 
that they're going to call me when something's wrong in their life. They're going to call me because it's mom. And they're going to call and say, this happened, and we'll talk about it, and then we'll pray. Because that's what we can do. I mean, I have miles between myself and my kids. Otherwise, I might be seeing them more frequently. I mean, you don't live on the same block anymore, not in America. But I digress. The point being is they were cognizant of their mother-son relationship. And it wasn't that Deborah was being cruel about it. She was saying, this is what happens when you have someone who is so horribly mean as Cesaro was. And he goes out and he robs, he kills, he destroys without ever thinking about what left, what, about the family at home. What is left of them? Because his devastation would be also devastating to his mom. She was going to die. We don't know what happened to her or anything. But we just sometimes have to think. Think it through. Um, you know, just think about, okay, if I do this, then how is it going to do this? In this case, Yael was righteous. She was right on target. She did exactly what she should have done. I don't think she thought it through. She just acted. So we have the choice of acting or reacting. She acted. She saw the enemy. She had the opportunity to take care of the enemy, and she did it just like that. She just took care of it. It was done. We need to do that with our enemy. Got a snake in your backyard? I've had a few in my backyard. I step on their heads and I crush them after I get through screaming first. And then I think, okay, you have to take care of this because there's no one else around. And so I kill the snake. What about you? Do you kill your snakes or do you run? I even kill spiders now. Read the book and you'll figure that one out. Shalou, shalom, Yerushalayim.